Our next speaker uh, this morning is Dr. Miriam Feldman K. There's a question to open the windows if you want air. I'm not sure that you want. After Miriam completed her undergraduate studies in the Theology Department of Cambridge and her PhD here in Israel, Miriam now lectures in the Jewish Philosophy Department at bar -Ilan. She also serves as visiting assistant professor at Jewish Theological Seminary and as chief editor of the new St. Andrew International Encyclopedia for Jewish Theology. In addition to work in interfaith dialogue, Miriam's chief areas of interest include the interface between contemporary Jewish thought and continental ph philosophy, as evidenced in her recently published book, Jewish Theology for a Postmodern Age. As a personal disciple and admirer of Rabbi Zacks, we can also thank Miriam for her instrumental role in the initiation and organization of this conference. Thank you, Professor Ross. I was going to say I didn't recognize some of those sentences from the bio I sent you. So. <laughs> Thank you for, for elaborating. Um, it's really wonderful to see such a great crowd here in person and an even larger crowd um, via the live stream. And uh, I have to say it's nice for me to take a small break from organizing the conference, <laughs> even if I have to give an academic paper to do so. Um, I'm going to present one claim through one method, um, inspired by uh, the quotation that Tamara, that Dr. Tamara Wright will bring, we have a moral obligation to be clear, from Rabbi Sachs. Um, Along the way, so this is part of some uh, broader research I'm going to touch along the way um, on the ideas of uh, on Rabbi Sachs, on uh, Baruch Spinoza, Hannah Arendt, and of course, Michel Foucault towards the end. So the claim is that the ideas present in the early writings of Sachs set forth the path for his entire body of writing that was to follow. They show his resistance to Enlightenment philosophy as one major theme. The seeds or ideas which he would later develop had been planted as far back as 1973. I'll weave in his early writings to my argument and show how these ideas set the stage for his, the Jewish thought he was consequently to pioneer. And today I'll focus on just one part of this argument, the Enlightenment philosophy from 16th, 17th century um, onwards and its implications for modern Jewish thought. So I propose that, to a great extent, Sachs saw the Enlightenment almost in its entirety as a colossal failure. This failure was exemplified by and culminated in the Shoah, which embodied for him the collapse of an entire Western system of thought. Sachs writes with great pathos of the hope of the emancipation of the Jews from the shtetls of Europe to bring about a new Jewish enlightenment, but paints its downfall in a poignant way. For me, he writes, the image that captures its almost unbearable pathos is of Sigmund Freud in 1939, exiled from Vienna, where his people were about to be turned into ashes, frantically writing his last work, Moses and Monotheism, in which he tried to show that Moses wasn't Jewish. By then, it was too late to do anything but weep. Certainly, Sachs believed that the Enlightenment was a philosophical renaissance of sorts, grounded in the emphasis of the pursuit of knowledge and ontological aspiration. 
It was founded upon the belief that the power of reason could bring about liberation and progress. And it's largely recognized to have been captured through Immanuel Kant's essay, um, Was ist Aufklärung? Um, what is enlightenment? The motto of enlightenment is, as he said, have the courage to use your own understanding. And Sachs described Enlightenment philosophy as the emergence of science and reason. And his respect for such an aspiration spans his works earlier and, of course, later. Sachs admired the freedom, equality, and human dignity, the tolerance, respect for individual rights, and the creation of a just and compassionate society, which this intellectual movement was believed to have set in motion. In some ways, it was even a realization of Judaism and a fulfillment of Jewish values, even stating that humanity, ethics, and religious truth were universal concepts arrived at by reason and accessible to all. However, it's also clear that Sachs viewed this position as limited at best and at worst flawed. The values of equality, toleration, and reason were ultimately eclipsed via the great eclipse as he says in the following ways. First, that reason and science, the reason and science that enlightenment propounded were highly abstract. Second, reason was dependent on its universalization. And this manifested itself blatantly. The enlightenment valued the universals, he said, and despised the particular. He understood this in relation to different movements in modern thought, including linking Kant's stress on human behavior and synthetic truth to the emotion, the emotion value of Hume, the focus on action of Jeremy Bentham, Mill, and utilitarianism, as well as the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre as total failures. Why? Because they were predicated upon a division between universalism and particularism, and in doing so excluded Judaism, which required its conceptualization as a particular. He took this claim very far, arguing that the whole thrust of post-Enlightenment thought has been hostile to religious belief in general and to classic Jewish beliefs in, in particular, claiming that it runs counter, actually, to the Kantian idea that ethics is essentially universal, a matter of rules that if they apply at all, they apply to all. Whereas Sachs, in contrast, wanted to posit that covenant is predicated on obligation and relation, and uh, Professor Reinhold has referred to some of these ideas already, and not autonomy and abstract reason. The notion of covenant as opposed to rationalist critique, is difficult to state, sustain, however, or it's worth considering, in fact, his, his uh, treatment of uh, Baruch Spinoza, who he does not call Benedict Spinoza, but Baruch Spinoza, um, a Jew whose early modern critical approach contributed to the intellectual development of this period. Despite Sachs's critique of the Enlightenment, as early as 1989, he had set out an ambivalent but also sympathetic response to Spinoza, noting his hidden Jewish Murano tradition and refusing to relinquish Spinoza's Jewish identity to write him off, as many thinkers have done. Covenant was more important than critique. As Sachs once said, I don't love all Judaisms, but I love all Jews. Enlightenment and the ways in which Jews had set out to respond to it had directly led to the cause of divisions between Jewish communities, which in 1993 he termed the fragmentation of Jewry in one people. This had been preceded by his call for unity, um, and thus he sought to re recontextualize these internal frictions as Arguments for the Sake of Heaven, published in 1990. The capacity to coexist became part of his vision, Faith in the Future, already uh, predicted or uh, envisioned in 1995 when he lays out the major themes which were to occupy him for decades to come. Dignity, Jewish identity, Jewish life, ethics and faith, morality, unity and hope. 
What enlightenment was meant to do to further progress, fraternity, equal rights, and what actually happened were two very different phenomena. As he wrote, emancipation heralded a new messianic age of universal brotherhood and all laws which tended to keep Jews as a separate people were at best irrelevant and at worst, they impeded the progress of civilization. Thus, he termed the Enlightenment the failure of success. At root for Sachs, as I mentioned, was that enlightenment was serve, served as a forebearer to the Shah. Um, it's interesting, just, it, it's, it's hard not to get into a discussion with some of the, the people in the room, especially uh, um, Rabbi Dr. Harris and, and Professor Reinhold on their, um, their, their book on um, um, Soloveitchik and Nietzsche, and you, you bring in Sachs's um, responses to, to, to Nietzsche at the beginning, but nonetheless, um, he does in many places link, bring together Nietzsche, Hegel, Kant, and Heidegger. Um, portraying them more often than not as virulent anti-Semites and a manifestation of uh, German Western philosophy, noting that the irony of ironies was that the very countries that gave birth to the Enlightenment were also those that gave birth to racial anti-Semitism and eventually the Holocaust. One of the subjects that preoccupied him in not going into post-Shoah theology now was his understanding of the problem of evil. His early references to Hannah Arendt tell somewhat of his understanding of evil as an enlightenment phenomenon. Sachs spoke of Arendt's idea of the banality of evil in the capacity of modernity's collapse into totalitarianism. Not incidentally, Arendt tries to find solutions to help, to help humans become humane since modern philosophy had not succeeded or failed to bring this about. His reading of Arendt, for, hu for whom modernity meant ultimately the loss of the world, allows him to begin a process of seeking out a new grounds for a vision of humanity. In parallel, to the fragmentation Sachs had described. Enlightenment philosophy had led Jewish thought, and now we've moved on from this um, um, eclipse or failure of success, and now, now I'm going to refer to how this played out in his, um, in his relation to um, Jewish thought. Jewish thought, as he saw it, had defined itself or come to be defined as modern Jewish thought. And this is a term that many of us use, of course. Um, however, he was resolute as early as the mid-1980s that this approach never really could have worked and never truly did. The examples he laments of Moses Mendelssohn, Herman Cohen, from reason to hope, placing reason within a Jewish framework, were ultimately doomed, even if at the time they were justified and necessary. And this focus wholly affected his views of other modern Jewish thinkers. Such an occupation was for Sachs a tangential. And, and even looking at the Rav Soloveitchik scholars, I, I'm still going to <laughs> make this claim. Modern Jewish thought and thinkers he claimed, were asking the wrong questions. I'm going to look this way. <laughs> we can have a discussion afterwards. Um, they were still wholly occupied by modern approaches and how they could be synthesized with Jewish traditional values. And I'm going to look at Dr. Freud Kandel um, for the courses that she taught me in Cambridge uh, uh, many years ago. And much of this is uh, based on her conceptualization of this. Um, even if the modern Jewish thinkers of the late 19th century who welcomed modernity were living in a, in a, in a different time, a period he called post-enlightenment pre-Holocaust, not just as a chronological issue, but as a philosophical one. And he considers this in relation to Shimshon Raphael Hirsch and Rav Kook as less relevant to the late 20th century 
because neither of them lived to see or experience the Holocaust and the state of Israel. And as he claimed already in the late 1980s, the essential hopes of Samson Raphael Hirsch and Rav Cook have been realized. In other words, what's next? What are the options? This leads him to claim that chapter in European intellectual history is now closed. So we're left with a question. What now should Jewish thought entail, if not the engagement of modern Judaism to which we have been accustomed? Now, very interestingly, um, as early as 1973, in fact, is one, I think, his first published work. It's wonderful there are many people here who could, uh, you know, would have their own uh, well, encyclopedic. Uh, uh, but I, I think that his uh, first published work of 1973 was on the thought of Franz Rosenzweig. And um, perhaps surprisingly enough, he had argued that the dialogical Jewish philosophy of Rosenzweig could move us, could have moved us, past the eclipse. Um, potentially for Rosenzweig's move to the dialogical, but also his notion of return, accessibility of the Hebrew texts, return to the sources, the Hebrew language, the openness of the lairhouse as a place of Jewish education. He claimed that this thought was indispensable to us, as he said, a more fundamental intellectual turn away from the rationalism and universalism that had held a previous generation captive, as in the modern Jewish thinkers, towards a reassessment, the value of an unapologetic assertion of Jewish differentness. Suffice it to say, and tragically, in terms of Rosenzweig's life, his Judaism did not live to see its full fruition because he did not experience the Holocaust. And it was for Sachs, alongside Martin Buber, Gershom Scholem et al., that it is too early to tell, in his words, whether they heralded or whether they would have heralded a new type of post-enlightenment thinking and, as he calls it, the first signs of the end of enlightenment and the birth of an era of, get ready, post-modernity. Okay. Not modern, not postmodern. He resisted a turn to postmodernism even though it is a movement, complex and self-contradictory, which resists enlightenment, enlightenment. A rejection of the postmodernism, a vehement rejection of the postmodernism of Foucault. These were some of the ideas he uh, shared with me and, and let's say, uh, encouraged me at the least to put to one side. Um, <laughs> Um, Foucault was also a great uh, critic of the um, Enlightenment, in a sense mirroring the, um, um, or, or ca counter-mirroring the, the description of, of, of Kant in Foucault's work, Foucault's works on the, the meaning of the Enlightenment, the order of things, the archaeology of knowledge, um, etc. But he decided not to go in this path, and I think Tamara is going to shed some more um, light on that. So what instead, you know, again, what are his options? So he claims that it should embody a cumulative and revolutionary shift in attitudes away from assumptions that had prevailed for almost 200 years. As early as 1985, Sachs was already speaking of a journey, a movement away in his work, Torah Studies. New Jewish thought must embody rethinking modernity, not integrating modernity. In this context, the role of Jews now in public intellectual discussion is critical. The type of Jewish responses should reject mo modern Enlightenment philosophy, or let's say as far as possible, to reach a position of, as he says, integrity and wholeness. He himself embodied his mission and laid out a model for Torah im Derech Eretz, which 
he claimed was not um, Samud aligned to, um, to modern values. And this model had already been set out in 1991 in Orthodoxy confronts modernity. One of the other options that he developed was through biblical interpretation. We're going to hear more about this um, later today. As he wrote, the freedom, equality. Let me just preface this. If, if the Enlightenment values, as I noted at the beginning, of equality and freedom as originating in Enlightenment philosophy was flawed, then how was he able to further those values? And he decided yeah, um, to, to root those values of liberal society in biblical theology. So the freedom, equality, and human dignity, tolerance, respect for individual rights, and the creation of a just and compassionate society, as I just quoted, were found in the Bible. A reframing of the idea of the individual as well was necessary. Um, here in addressing already the idea of the consumer and the role of the family already in 1995. N not least importantly, that these themes were all to be interconnected. This was already laid out in 1993. These disciplines are interwoven. And so even as far as the year 2020, if Judaism was to respond to these internal issues, it also was obligated to deal with economics, ecology, sustainability, politics, and so on. Why? Because it's all part of Der Eretz. To conclude, the Jews for Sachs now have a more prominent and vocal role to play on the stage of human um, in the stage of humanity and just thinking about his TED talk in uh, 2017 we can see that he embodied this himself speaking to a, um, a far a far broader audience um, whilst he confronted new challenges as they arose and he did indeed do that and even, you know, on, on the, perhaps the most recent example through the coronavirus crisis, where I think people look to him, you know, well, well what's, what, what's Rabbi Sachs going to say? You know, we're, we're, we're waiting for his response. And he, and he did respond to that. So although he was um, um, amalgamating these new, um, the, these new phenomenon as they arose, they were very much based on all of these earlier works that preceded them and final quote it's a call to action the intellectual challenge facing Jewry today is quite different to the modern Jewish thought it is to think and write as Jews we have earned the right to do so and in the wake of the failure of the enlightenment we have the duty to do so. For 200 years, Jewish intellectuals felt the need to distance themselves from Judaism. That is true no longer. Enlightenment had precluded Jews from contributing to humanity, and Jewish, th Jewish thought in some ways had become entangled in an Enlightenment problem and represented for Sachs a knot to be undone. He undertook the task, not only of untying the knot carefully, but he also examined and retied. And this was his redefinition of Jewish thought, no less of Jewish life, and a new model of Jewish philosophy with which to contend in contemporary times. Thank you.